Uh, nullification was spelled out in a document that Jefferson uh, drafted anonymously in 1798, known as the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. <clears throat> and in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, Jefferson is going to lay out the objections to the Alien and Sedition Acts, and then a possible course of action that the states might consider following in order to counter this federal usurpation. Constitutions, Jefferson understood, do not enforce themselves. I mean, if you violate them, there are no fangs that come out and bite you. I mean, you have to, you have to enforce them through vigilance. You can't just expect them to be enforced automatically. Jefferson proposed basically the following, that since the states created the, fe states came before the federal government, obviously, I mean, this, this does not need to be explained to anybody other than a certain institute out in California that will remain nameless. Um, we'll tell you that over lunch if you need to know that, but the point is the states were obviously there first. They created the federal government and endowed it with certain enumerated powers. Um, by the way, whether this actually worked out in the long run can be judged by glancing at the federal government now and seeing is this actually the scrupulously limited government limiting itself to its delegated powers that the framers envisioned, I think it's obvious enough. But Jefferson's view was that the states created the federal government, they sent delegates to a constitutional convention, they approved the constitution, they ratified it state by state, so the constituent unit always was understood to be the state. Well, they have not, according to Jefferson, they've not created a Frankenstein's monster that gets to interpret the scope of its own powers and tell the states themselves what their own constitution means. If the federal government has the final word on the scope of its own powers, if the federal government gets to be the exclusive judge as to what powers were delegated to it and what not, and what the meaning of those words in Article 1, Section 8 is, then what's going to happen, obviously, is that the federal government will, will, given that no one can challenge its interpretation of the Constitution, will interpret that instrument more and more broadly so as to amass more power to the center. So Jefferson's next step was to say, States created the federal government, they endowed it with certain limit, limited uh, powers, but if the federal government should go beyond the powers that were delegated, then the states have the right to interpret the Constitution for themselves and to judge that an infraction has taken place and to refuse to enforce the offending law, that is to nullify the offending law. It doesn't mean that th they would be repealing the law, but they would simply be saying that insofar as uh, their state is concerned, the law will not be enforced. Now here's how Jefferson words this in, in one of the passages from the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. This is the crux of Jefferson's argument right here. He says, resolved that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principles of unlimited submission to their general government, but that by compact under the style and title of a constitution for the United States and of amendments thereto, they constituted a general government for special purposes, delegated to that government certain definite powers, reserving each state to itself the residuary mass of right to their own self-government, and that whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. That to this compact each state acceded as a state, and is an integral party, its co-states forming as to itself the other party that the government created by this compact was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, since that would have made its discretion and not the Constitution the measure of its powers, but that as in all other cases of compact among parties having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge of itself as well of infractions as of the mode and measure of redress. That's a beautiful passage. It's a beautiful passage. I used to, and by the way, I'm not up here to make fun of my students because I like them. They're decent kids. They just, you know, it's mostly not their fault uh, that they haven't been taught things. But I used to assign the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. No one can understand this language. Okay, so th in a way, it sort of makes you think, are they trying deliberately to make us dumb so that we can't read Jefferson telling us here, hey, you have the right to nullify and whatever. Well, the next, um, next year, the Kentucky legislature, and by the way, that was this, these resolutions are passed by the Kentucky legislature. This was a common thing that in, in, the, in colonial times, 
uh, like the Virginia Resolves against the Stamp Act, when you want to make a statement at the highest level of the state that indicates the, the opinion of that state at that time, you pass resolutions through the colonial legislature, or in this case, the state legislature. Well, the next year, Kentucky drafts further resolutions in which the word nullification actually appears. And it reads as follows, uh, the relevant portion. If those who administer the general government be permitted to transgress the limits fixed by that compact by a total disregard to the special delegations of power therein contained, an annihilation of the state governments and the creation upon their ruins of a general consolidated government will be the inevitable consequence. That the principle and construction contended for by sundry of the state legislatures, that the general government is the exclusive judge of the extent of the power gated, powers delegated to it, stop nothing short of despotism, since the discretion of those who would administer the government and not the Constitution would be the measure of their powers. The several states who form that instrument, being sovereign and independent, have the unquestionable right to judge of the infraction and a nullification by those sovereignties of all unauthorized acts done under color of that instrument is the rightful remedy. Hmm. All right, well, that's the, Jefferson, that's the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. Now, Jefferson is portraying this course of action as the moderate course. I mean, today it's extremist and wacko. This was the moderate course. It was the middle ground between secession and submission. It was a way of telling his friends who he thought, uh, uh, he thought some of his friends were too anxious to secede, that here is a way that we can stay in the Union and enjoy whatever benefits accrue to us from that, uh, and not have to give that up, but at the same time be able to resist and be able to resist usurpations of, of state powers. This is the moderate course. That's the same position that Calhoun t John C. Calhoun took in 1832-33 uh, to 33, when some people in South Carolina were saying we need to secede over the tariffs. Calhoun said the moderate approach was nullification. There are some people, by the way, who believe in secession and do not believe in nullification. They think that nullification is just a crazy idea that can't work. But it does seem to be of a piece. The, idea of, the ideas of nullification and secession do seem to derive from the same conceptions of the Federal Union. Well, let's also look at the Virginia Resolutions of 1798 drafted by James Madison. James Madison, rightly or wrongly, is, is referred to as the father of the Constitution. Presumably he would know a little something about this. Um, Madison, I'm going to read you a little excerpt from the Virginia Resolutions. Madison later came to regret having written this and spent the rest of his career trying to explain that the Virginia Resolutions of 1798 did not actually mean what they obviously did mean. And so, I mean, partisan humor used to, t you know, used to um, d poke a lot of fun at uh, the fact that Madison seemed to be changing his mind. There's a whole cottage industry of Madison admirers out there who write books showing that, no, Madison was perfectly consistent in his whole career. Well, if that's how you want to spend your career, um, you know, arguing that Madison is totally consistent, I mean, I guess it's one way to spend a career, but... Um, my friend uh, Kevin Gutzman at, um, at um, Western Connecticut State University has argued very much to the contrary. But let's look at the Virginia Resolutions. Madison said, A spirit has in sundry instances been manifested by the federal government to enlarge its powers by forced constructions of the constitutional charter which defines them. And indications have appeared of a design to expound certain general phrases so as to destroy the meaning and effect of the particular enumeration which necessarily explains and limits the general phrases, and so to consolidate the states by degrees into one sovereignty. Well, for example, what, what he's getting at there is that he already sees in the 1790s a trend whereby certain general phrases in the Constitution, such as the General Welfare Clause, for example, would be interpreted so broadly that they... Would pr that the interpretation would permit the federal government to exercise powers really that were not dreamed of by the framers of the Constitution. And what he's saying is that in Article I, Section 8, that lists the powers of the Congress. And if the federal government had actually been authorized to put into effect any measure that it thought would tend toward the general welfare, then why did they bother specifically enumerating the federal government's powers if they had whatever power would advance the general welfare. It seems it would render the specific listing of powers nugatory and absurd. 